Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fly Tying Monday. I hope that uh, all of you had a Merry Christmas and you're going to have a great new year. And we're going to be starting the new year with a very tough challenge between Tim Flagler and myself, the classic muddler minnow, which both of us hate tying. Um, but everybody, everybody wants to know how to tie a muddler minnow because it's, it's a great pattern. It's a classic old pattern. Uh, Phil Monahan used to be, um, uh, editor of American Angler Magazine, and the, uh, the, he used to work with Art Sheck, who was the editor of uh, Fly Tire Magazine for a long time. And Art told Phil that you could run, every month in the magazine, you could run an article on how to, how to tie a muddler minnow, and nobody would complain. So <laughs> we're going to tie a muddler minnow. We've never done it. I've never done it live. Um, Tim and I certainly haven't done it in a challenge, so it's going to be it's going to be lots of fur flying. There's going to be a lot of mistakes, and um, yeah, it's going to be uh, quite the quite the event. So I hope you'll join us for that. But today we're going to tie something really easy because you know it's between Christmas and New Year. Nobody does much. Uh, I picked an easy fly. What the hell? I figured you didn't want to work too hard either. So we picked an easy fly. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about this, um, this uh, soft tackle, tactical spider. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, soft tackles in general. And uh, I'll show you two ways to tie this fly because it is, it is quite simple. Um, but I, I'm going to show you two ways to tie it. And um, somebody's saying my picture is all flashy. Does anybody else see my picture all flashy? Looks good for my end. Maybe it's at your, it might be at your end, Mike. <laughs> How is the picture for everybody else? Oh, by the way, if you're new, welcome. Uh, we've been doing this for, oh, a year and three quarters now, every Monday. And um, if you're new, uh, welcome to fly tying Monday and let us know, let us know if you're, uh, if you're new, let us know if you've never, never been here before and, um, hope you're going to tie along because, um, looks like my picture is fine. So whoever had a flashy picture, I'm afraid it's on your end and not on ours. Um, anyway, if you're new, let us know. Mark says his shoes are new. Well, congratulations, Mark. You've got a pair of shoes for Christmas. Um, anyway, soft tackles. And this is a very simple fly, the very unadorned simple fly. And it's a good opportunity to discuss simple flies because some of the best, most effective flies are very, very simple. And there's a, there's a theory um, that, that, I subscribe to, and I know a lot of other anglers and fly tires subscribe to, that when you make a fly too complicated and put too many parts on it, uh, the fish can find something wrong with it. Whereas if your fly is very simple profile, very simple outline, not a lot of materials, um, the fish is going to see it, get the impression of, of something to eat and grab it. And you know we tend to we tend to over embellish a lot of our flies. We feel that they have to have a rib or they have to have a hot spot or or this or that. And you know when we when we work on flies or when somebody's developing a new fly, they they often tend to put too much on it just to make it theirs, to make it different. They add they add something to it. Um, but there is really something to be said for very very simple flies. And it's nice because if you're um, headed out for a trip or you're trying to fill your fly box, um, you, you, know, you don't want to spend a half hour on, on all the flies you, you put together. So um, you know, definitely don't, don't be fooled by simple patterns. And this is, this fly is, is a uh, hare's ear and partridge hackle or some other soft tackle. That's it. That's all there is to it. There's not even a rib on this fly. And, um, 
So, and we're going to talk about substitute feathers too. I see Kevin said something about substitutes and there's lots of things you can substitute um, in these soft tackles. But um, why don't we start and I'll tie one kind of the, the traditional way and then then I'll, I'll tie one uh, showing you how to use, uh, if your feathers are too long, well, because uh, they often are, it's, it's hard to tie little tiny soft tackles and you can't, can't get a, a soft tackle feather uh, short enough. I'll show you a way to, to, uh, to use uh, different kinds of materials to make a soft tackle. So anyway, let's start. I'm going to put a hook in a vise and the hook I'm using is a, uh, Orvis tactical wide gape hook in a size 14. It's barbless. These are great hooks. Uh, not only do they hook well, but despite being barbless, uh, these flies hold very well because of that, that turned in point there. And so um, it's, it's a great little hook, fairly light wire. You can tie dry flies on these if you want. Um, I'm going to attach my thread. This is 8 -0. Can use 6080, 120, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to attach my thread. And then I'm going to bring it up to just behind the eye. Very, very close to the eye. And then I'm going to take a partridge hackle. And I'm going to tie this partridge hackle in, and then we're going to talk about some substitutes. But this is a, uh, a whole skin of a Hungarian partridge, and there's, there's lots of feathers on this. But the most, the most important ones, the ones you're going to use the most, are the ones down the center here. Some of these, uh, uh, I'm going to show you how to use some of these feathers off to the side, the wing-covered feathers. Uh, you know, if you want a gray uh, partridge hackle, you get that on the side. The brown stuff that we use most of the time is in the center. And there are some, there are some uh, feathers that are a little bit smaller down here toward the, the bottom of the cape, but they're, they're often uh, not that small, but you could tie maybe a 16 down into here. And you can see the gray, the gray feathers on this side, the brown ones in the middle. Um, tail, Tail fibers, you can use for wing cases on nymphs and things like that. So we're going to take, um, I'm going to take a nice uh, symmetrical feather from the center. The size, the size, one, one that's nicely speckled, that doesn't have any broken, um, broken fibers on it. So I've got one here. It looks nice. And I'm going to strip the fuzzy stuff from the bottom. I'm going to actually make sure that this is about, yeah, that's about the right length. Um, and then I'm going to hold it by the very tip. And I'm going to just stroke most of the fibers back to get them out of the way. And then I'm going to take my scissors and I'm going to just cut along the stem. Hard to do here in front of the camera. I'm going to cut along the stem to leave myself some little nubs there. Doing this will help the feather from, keep the feather from pulling out. So we got our feather prepared. And this may be this may be a different way than you've tied soft tackles before if you've tied them. And then I'm going to I'm going to lay this feather right up against the eye, like so. Stroke those those fibers stroke those fibers back so they stay out of the way. And I want the dull side or the concave side facing me. So you can see it's it's got a, it's got quite a curve to it, and the concave say, side is going to face me, and then I'm just going to wrap back over that feather 
I'm gonna cut that stem a little shorter because it's getting in the way. And I'm gonna wrap back and this is gonna bind down that feather so it won't pull out. I'm just gonna wind back. And if the feather's a little bit too long, I'll probably cut it here. There, okay. And then we're gonna wind back to the bend, like so. And now I'm gonna take some hair's ear fur. And I like, I like to make my own hair's ear. You can buy pre-blended hair's ear. Um, it's usually doesn't have as many guard hairs in it. I, I like to, when I make a, a dark hair's ear, I blend it specially. I use just the dark fur from the um, hair's mask. And then I cut all the spiky little hairs off the ears. All those little spiky hairs on the ears are what gives you that, that really buggy looking fur. So, whoops. I'm just going to take a little bit of this. I don't need much. That's going to be enough for about five flies. So I don't need much. I'm going to come back to my thread. And I'm going to just take a very little, just a, just a little bit of a fuzz. And I'm going to dub that on there to start out. I'll move it up so you can see it. So you can see, um, it's not, I'm not putting much on, uh, but I'm putting a lot of pressure on it. And you don't need wax. Well, you might need wax, but if you do need wax, you just need to practice your dubbing technique a little bit because this stuff should go on without wax. Any questions, Julia, at this point? Yes. Uh, someone asked what the history of this fly is, and I thought that was interesting. I know we didn't talk. I, I know you, you mentioned it a little bit at the beginning when you were talking about, um, or you were talking about the other fly that you're doing on Monday, but uh, they wanted to yeah. see if there was any other info. The, the um, heron partridge is a very old English pattern. And uh, the, the tactical spider, I think, was a tactical spider. It, it's just a soft tackle on a tactical hook. Uh, it's a, it's an old, it's an old English pattern. Uh, I think they were this type of fly, these type of flies they call spiders were developed in Yorkshire and, um, you know, it's a soft tackle. I don't know a lot about the origin of it because it is a, a very old, old traditional pattern. So I don't know, I'm afraid I don't know that much more about the about the history of it. And now I'm just going to wind, wait till my fur starts on the first turn there. And I'm just going to wind this nice tight. Right up to the feather. And I see that I've got too much fur on there. So I'm just going to back it up a couple turns. I'm going to pluck, just pluck some of that off and then retwist it and finish up. So there's my body, no rib, fairly sparse. Um, you know, not much there. It's all you need is the impression of, of bugginess. And then I am going to take my feather and grab it with my hackle pliers. And you want to be uh, very gentle with a partridge hackle. You don't want to really yank on it. These are these feathers are fairly um, fairly delicate. 
I'm going to grab the end of the stem with my hackle pliers. And then I'm going to stroke this back. And you can actually pinch it a little bit so that all the fibers lay back in one direction. You can even wet it if you want a little bit to help it stay in place. And then I'm just gonna wind this being careful that the feathers lie back and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go forward just slightly and I'm only gonna make two turns. That's all you want on this fly. These flies should be very sparse. I'm only taking two turns and then I'm gonna tie this off. Trying not to catch any fibers when I come around. I caught a couple. We'll push them back. Cut the stem. And then you can see I got a couple fibers sticking up front. So I'm just gonna, just gonna work them back. And I don't wanna go back too far over that hackle because I don't want it to sweep back too much. I want it to kind of stand out. You want this to you want these feathers to stand out because you want this thing to to vibrate and pulsate in the current. It's gonna when the current when it, it's on under tension, they're gonna sweep back. And then when the current lessens, they're gonna they're gonna move out like that. And who knows what this looks like? An emerging wing, the legs of an insect. Uh, nobody knows, but we do know that a fly tied like this is, um, is very deadly. And that's it. We're going to whip finish. And then we're going to talk about tying it a different way and about some substitutions. So I'm just going to take four turns here. It's a very elegant little fly. And I can't believe nobody's asked how you fish these. One way to fish them is just, is just throw it across the stream and let it swing around in the current. And that'll work. Usually uh, works quite well for smaller fish. Uh, you can fish these directly upstream in which case you have to really watch for, it's not gonna sink very deep, it's more of an emerger. So you, you're gonna watch for a boil when the fish takes it or watch for your line to tighten. Um, I don't like fishing these with an indicator. Another way to do it, it's probably the most deadly way, is to estimate where you think a fish is that's kind of downstream and across from you cast across the river, make a really big mend, let the fly drift a little bit to sink, then make another big mend so that the line and the leader stay in the same current lane as the fly. And then when it gets to the spot where you think the fish is, uh, stop mending and just uh, stop following the fly with your rod tip and the fly will rise to the surface uh, hopefully right in front of the fish, which is a, a real trigger to the fish. Um, it's a little bit more difficult than just swinging them in the current, and it'll work, particularly in riffles. Just throw it out there and let it swing behind you, and it'll work. Um, I also often fish these when I'm fishing nymphs with indicators or dry dropper. Uh, I'll put a heavier weighted fly down below, and I'll tie this above that heavy... Uh, weighted nymph with a dropper. So this one is more of a kind of a mid-water, closer to the surface thing. And it works quite well there. So lots and lots of ways you can fish it. You could even put dry fly floating on this and float it if you want. Um, not the way most people fish them. But it's, you know, it's designed, not all nymphs have beads and not all nymphs should be weighted. Some There are times when um, a nymph that's just under the surface or in midwater will work better than a, than a nymph along the bottom. And this is for one of those instances. All right, questions so far? Uh, we're getting a lot of specific questions around, um, well, of course, once you asked about how to fish it. So, but right. also for like different variants, like 
Do you ever weight them for faster moving water? What works for bigger fish? What are common sizes? Um, common, si common sizes would be uh, size 12 through 16. That's okay. what most people fishermen. Uh, and yes, I do occasionally put a bead on it. And I put the bead between the body and the hackle. So the hackle goes over the top of the bead. But um, unlike most flies, if you're going to swing this like a soft hackle, mm -hmm. you want the you want to use a small bead, the smallest bead you can get on the hook. Uh, you just want to add a bead to get a little bit of, of weight and sparkle, but um, not a big bead. But don't put beads on everything, people. Mm -hmm. uh, not not all nymphs have to have beads on them, and and sometimes uh, sometimes things are effective without a bead. So. You know, tie some of these up just like this before you go sticking beads on them. And um, <laughs> someone asked, what does this fly imitate? Now, who knows? <laughs> I do not have a clue. I really don't. Um, it just works. <laughs> it works when there's emerging caddisflies very well. Um, but also works when there's emerging mayflies. And it works when there's nothing around. Uh, it's just a bug. It's a bug. It could even be a little minnow. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, but it doesn't imitate anything specific. It's a good fly for when you don't know what the fish are taking. Really good fly when you just see an occasional rise and you don't see any rises that are steady enough that you can target, but you know the fish are kind of looking toward the surface. And by swinging this over a wide area of water, you can usually pick up a fish. Okay, we've got lots of questions coming in. Okay, uh, let's answer. Let's answer. Let's <laughs> answer. Right. Jacob said, uh, "One of my favorite ways to fish these is on a Euro rig as the dropper with a heavy point fly. Dead mm -hmm. drift it till uh, till it gets downstream from you, then let her swing. Two presentations, one cast, and they they're asking if Great. they ever do that. Terrific idea. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um." And then another, we have another question. Why are you not using ribbing? Um, is it, it's not, does it make the body, is it better or does it make the body stronger? Uh, I'm not using ribbing because the pattern doesn't call for ribbing. Mm -hmm. And you could put a rib on it if you want, but mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it needs it. Okay. And, you know, uh, th this, this fly, if you, if you dub that body properly, um, that the fly's going to hold up just fine without needing needing a rib for durability. Okay. Um, and you know, uh, ribbing is usually a, a tinsel or a wire that has a little flash, and sometimes you don't want flash in your flies. So, um, you know, you can put a rib on it if you want. Okay. Absolutely. Um, uh, Jill's asking any other deadly color combos, maybe purple and black. Well, there's all sorts of, yeah, there's all sorts of soft tackles. This is just one of, of many, many, many different kinds of soft tackles. So you, you, could, you could make these any color you want, any color that might be effective. This is, this is we're tying the hare and partridge spider. That's one soft tackle. There's, there's you know, <laughs> purple and partridge. There's purple and hare. There's orange, orange and partridge. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of different ones. So yeah, you can vary this. Absolutely. This is just use this as a model and, and vary the colors. Yeah. Um, John's asking any idea if this can be tied for larger fish like a steelhead. I would think a steelhead would take it in a larger size. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, steelhead or than... just rainbow trout. Ooh. Okay. You know? Uh, other than tradition, why do you leave so much hook shank exposure? Hook shank exposure. Well, this is a short shank hook. And if I tied it, if I tied it mm -hmm. back any further, uh, I would, uh, I would make the fly curved and I, I, I don't want it curved in this case. Right. All right. Uh, I did use, I did, I think I did use up the, yeah, I used up the whole shank, really. I mean, it's not short, it's not, I'm not leaving anything exposed. By tying this sparse, by tying this sparse like this, you make it a lot more subtle. Mm 
and I think mm -hmm. it, it will sink a little bit better. Okay. Yep. Um, would CDC work well as hackle on this fly? Work mm -hmm. as well as hackle? Okay. Yeah, it wouldn't. It, it would be tougher to make it sink. Uh -huh. The CDC tends to, it's so fluffy that it tends to make things float, but you could, could use CDC. You can use any soft feather uh, at all. Absolutely. All right. Those I was, I was, si I was sitting in the couch last night and some random <laughs> duck feather came out of a pillow and I pulled it out and I said, hmm, that would make a nice soft tackle. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I kept it. <laughs> so yeah, you, you know. You got a dead chickadee around your bird feeder. You could try some of those. Get resourceful. Don't shoot chickadees, though. It's illegal. You can shoot starlings if you want. <laughs> starlings are not protected. You can shoot starlings and English sparrows all you want. But don't get okay. your pelican out and start hitting the chickadees and the goldfinches because you get in trouble. <laughs> um <laughs> Uh, besides ribbing, what's another material you could use to add some flash if you wanted without losing the sparse effect? You could, you know, you could uh, add a little um, uh, ice dubbing to the hairs here, or you could okay. add a little chopped up, chopped up, really fine, flashy material, like angel hair. Yeah, hmm. you could, nice. you could definitely add a little sparkle to it if you wanted to, or even some some antron yarn you know, uh, chop up antron yarn and mix it in with the hairs here. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But there's something magical about just plain old hairs here, people. Um, it, it's like pheasant tail, you know, it, it just, hairs here just works. Uh, the, the dubbing just works. It must, it's the, I think it's the modeling and the little tiny fibers that stick out that uh, imitates motion or maybe holds air bubbles. Who knows? But it just works. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with it. So, yeah, you can substitute all you want. And um, how many soft hackles do you fish at a time? Oh, really good question, Tobias. Um, I almost always fish two soft tackles. Uh, I think that it seems to be more effective when you're swinging wet flies or soft tackles to use two at a time. Um it must attract, it probably attracts the fish's attention more, seeing two things go by and and probably three would be good too. But I, I tend to get tangled when I, and tying, tying two droppers on a line is a pain in the butt. Um, so I usually stick with two. And if you fish two of these, you don't want to tie them in line. You don't want to tie the lower fly to the upper fly by going around the hook bend. Um, you want to tie a separate dropper if you're fishing two of these. It's definitely going to be more effective as a second dropper. Any other questions? Uh, How do you fish this in still water? Uh, yep. I would, I would uh, cast it out and retrieve it very, very slowly, just barely under tension in still water. Okay. Uh, yes, you can fish this under an indicator. Absolutely. If you want, uh, you're not going to, you don't want to swing it with an indicator. You know, uh, indicators don't tend to make your fly swing very well. They make a lot of commotion on the surface. So if you're swinging it, uh, leave your indicator off. Uh, but if you're fishing it upstream or cross stream dead drift, yeah, you could fish it. Definitely fish it with an indicator. Yep. Okay. All let's right. Talk about style. Let's, uh, let's talk about some substitution. So I'm going to show you some different feathers um, that you can use. And all of these will work really well. Um, you know, one is bobwhite quail. If you hunt or you know someone that hunts, they have very nice. Change your exposure here a little bit. Yeah, that's better. Oh. There we go. Um, bobwhite quail have nice feathers and they tend to be smaller. Than Hungarian partridge. Um, woodcock, if you hunt woodcock, have a darker, soft feather. Uh, snipe feathers are good. Uh, morning dove are, make a really, have a really nice blue dun color, and that makes a beautiful soft tackle. Um, if you, you know, if you live in a, 
a state where um, morning dove hunting is allowed. It's not allowed in where I live in Vermont, but um, some states you can hunt doves. And there's your Hungarian partridge feather from the neck, the smaller feather. Uh, there's your Hungarian partridge feather from the back. And then this is a really good substitute. These are chicken feathers from a hen, speckled hen feathers. And you can see they look pretty close to that partridge. So uh, the advantage of these speckled hen feathers too is that um, is that you can you can get uh, various sizes. They come, you know, you buy a cape with these speckled hen feathers, and they come in lots of different sizes. Hungarian partridge you usually only get two or three, two two sizes, maybe three. Speckled hen you can tie um, any size you want. Be very careful when you use speckled hen, um, not to make, not to hackle it too heavy. Uh, resist the urge to use the whole feather. Just take a, two turns and tie it off, and you're done. You you want that you want that fly to be very sparse. All right, questions about that, and you know any other soft feather from the breast or the neck of, of a bird will work. There's lots of different feathers you can use. Okay. All right. So now we're going to tie, and now, yeah, I'm going to tie a smaller one this time. I'm going to tie a, I'm going to tie a size 16. And it's tough to find decent hackle for a 16. So there's a smaller one. And we're going to do sort of a faux distribution wrap here. So I'm going to start my I'm going to start my fly the same way by starting my thread. And then I'm going to come right to the eye right up to the eye. And now, I gotta pull my partridge out of the... So there's a bunch of feathers up here that are way too big to tie uh, soft tackles with, and the stems are really thick, but we can use these to tie a soft tackle. So what you want to do is find one with some nice modeling to it. This one looks pretty good. And you're going to start it the same way by stripping away the webby stuff at the bottom. And you'll get two flies out of this. And what you want to do is stroke these fibers off to the side till they're all lined up like so. Grab them by the tips and pluck them. Then you're gonna come over to your fly and you're gonna measure these. You probably want them about one and a half uh, to two hook gaps. So maybe like right about there and what you want to do is just kind of distribute those around, just kind of roll them around there and take a nice, I'm going to make those a little longer. Take a nice soft loop around those and gather them around the hook. And you actually want you want to do what you normally don't want to do. You want those to roll all the way around the hook, like so. So it looks kind of messy right now. Bear with me. And you want those right up against the eye. And just leave them there. And then you're going to come back and snip off the butt ends. And bind that down. I think I missed one there. No, I got it. 
Come back to the bend. Put a little bit more hair zero on. Same, same way we did the same way we did the first one. Start with just a little fuzz. And this is a size 16, so I'm going to use even a little bit less here. This body's going to be a little fatter than I want it, but that's okay. And wind your body. A little bit of a taper. You don't need too much of a taper on these flies. Come right up to those. Come right up to those uh, fibers in the front. And then what you want to do is just stroke these back and kind of distribute them around the hook. Grab them all. Come up in front of them. Take a couple turns. And then you can redistribute them. Look at it, make sure you got them kind of all around. And if they're not quite distributed, you can just work them around a little bit. Take a couple more turns. You don't want to str you don't want to sweep them back too much. You still want that hackle to stand out to the side. And then whip finish. So this is a way of using those longer fibers to tie a soft tackle without having to wind it. There you go. So there's a, there's a little soft tackle using a big feather. So not too hard. Just a little, just a little speck of, just a little speck of fuzz is all you need. And that will, that is a deadly, deadly fly, as simple as it is. Okay, more questions? Not yet, no. A couple of people just asking uh, some duplicate questions, but okay, they were asking what hook you were using on the most recent one. Um, oh, same hook, same hook, a size 16. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whoops. That's it. I did see. That's it. Uh, That's oh, all. did you answer the hotspot question already? Caller, the hotspot caller be beneficial or not necessary? Roger Bird was asking, and then Justin was asking. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't tie him with a hotspot, but hotspots seem to be hot these days, no pun intended. So <laughs> you could try it. <laughs> you can try it. I really. I really um, like this as a as a subtle fly, and so I don't put I don't I like it the way it is. I don't put flash on it. I don't put a hot spot on it. Not that you couldn't. I need the Hubble telescope to see a size sixteen, Greg. If you need the Hubble telescope to see a size sixteen, you just need better glasses. That's all. If you can't, if you're having trouble with 16s, get yourself some good close-up glasses. Um, you got to have them. As soon as you hit 40, you're going to need them. Guaranteed. If you're over 40, you need close-up glasses to tie flies. Period. End of story. Unless you have a very unusual vision. Hubble makes bifocals. <laughs> Great, John. Thank you. <laughs> Suggestion to stop them sweeping back. Add a small thorax. It helps them stay more upright. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good suggestion, Kevin. Um, you know, or just build up your body a little bit more um, as you get toward the front, and that'll that'll help them stand up more. Yeah, great, great suggestion. Yeah, you could use a different color thread for the head if you wanted a hot spot. You could use like a bright orange if you wanted a hot spot on this. Uh, let's see what else.
Any other questions there, Julia? I don't think so. I think you've answered them all. Oh. Orvis sells 5X fly tying glasses. They're great. Yeah. They're they're terrific. And you can't you can't get four or five X uh, normally if you go to buy a pair of uh, reading glasses. Um, the, the most you can get is usually two, two and a half diopters. Um, but it, sometimes you need four and five. And I'm telling you, the closer you can get to a fly um, when you're tying, the closer you can focus, um, the better your tying is going to be. And lots of light, lots of light and good glasses and you can tie 24s anybody can tie 24s if you got good light and you got good glasses and a little practice what weight poly leaders for swinging uh I, you know i i jacob i typically don't use i typically swing these on a floating line um but I, I assume you're talking about sinking poly leaders. I would say the lightest, uh, you know, the uh, the trout size, uh, the, uh, intermediate or the fast sinking would probably be the best. But I typically fish these on a, a floating line. But you know, if you got heavy water um, and you're trying to get a little deeper, yeah, probably a, the intermediate or the uh, the uh, trout size, uh, not the extra fast sinking, but the, just the fast sinking would work. If you use orange thread, it would be a partridge in orange. Oh, close. Partridge in orange, I believe David has an orange uh, floss body, then a hair's ear thorax, and then the, the partridge. How about greasing your leader to fish in the film? Yep, great idea, Ken. Great idea. Um, you know, if the fish are taking emergers just under the surface, uh, if you think they're taking emergers, if you see rises but you don't see bubbles and the fish are swirling just under the surface, uh, greasing your leader um, almost all the way up to the fly. And uh, then using a fly like this would be very, very deadly. Great, great suggestion. Yep. What species of trout would specifically target this wet fly? Keith, any species of trout. It doesn't matter, trout or trout. And they all eat pretty much the same bugs. Um, I, I don't think it, uh, I've caught brook trout, brown trout, rainbow trout, cutthroat trout, grayling, uh, you know, pretty much the, all the common species on this fly. Uh, that looks like all the questions, huh, Julia? Well, thank you everyone. For, for joining us today. It really means a lot that you're that you're here and um, asking such great questions. We really um, we really appreciate you coming on and hopefully some of you tied along with us. Hopefully some of you are new, if you are welcome. Um, and don't miss next Monday because it's gonna be a you know what show uh, with Flagler and me trying to tie a, a muddler minnow. It's <laughs> <laughs> Neither of us are looking forward to it. So you should be looking forward to it because it's going to be fun for you to watch us screw up. So <laughs> I hope that uh, I hope that you'll all be able to join us um, next Monday. And um, happy New Year to everyone. Thank you for thank you for tuning in. And um, we'll see you soon.